Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my thoughts. And I'm just going to say 100% to Robert, uh, everything he said. Um, and uh, I'm just eager to see what you all think about the things that I have to say today. So I'm Sarah Kaplan and my pronouns are she and her. And I think I'm on this panel, I thought I was on this panel uh, to talk about um, uh, you know, my interventions into stakeholder capitalism. I am gonna talk about the bankruptcy of the business case. So I've given my talk the title, Race Stakeholder Capitalism in Democracy with the emphasis on some thoughts. And I'm gonna talk about a lot of books that have inspired me. So I'm also going to give you your summer reading list. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen for a minute because I want to start, as we always do in Canada, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I wish to express my gratitude today for this land on which I live and work these days, which is the traditional territory of the Nauset and the Wampanoag peoples, which is today uh, known as Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And if I were home in Toronto, where I haven't been for 15 months because of the pandemic, I would speak of the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this here on Zoom is a virtual meeting place. So wherever we are, we are surely uh, still somewhere in the home of indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I'm gonna use this land acknowledgement as kind of an entry point to this conversation um, because that language is sort of the formalized language, but I wanna tell you about what the land acknowledgement means to me personally. I have to go back to the 1700s uh, in what is now Northern Ireland, where my mother's Presbyterian family fought against severe and discriminatory restrictions placed on Presbyterians about what trades they could practice and how they could make a livelihood. They eventually left in 1773 for the Americas where they could work and pray without restrictions, starting in Philadelphia and my part of the McGovney diaspora, making it all the way to California where my mother and later I was born. Or we have to go to the Pale of Settlement in what is now known as Lithuania in the 1880s, uh, where my father's Jewish family fled the pogroms, eventually departing from Holland to arrive penniless in New York City, where my great grandfather, who spoke only Yiddish, pushed a fruit cart on Orchard Street and on the Lower East Side, and where my grandfather was the first in his family to go to university and did so at Colgate University in the first year that they admitted Jews. Uh, and he later taught mathematics at James Madison High to the likes of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Bertie Sanders. Um, the point is that my family sought refuge in the Americas, and it is only because of that refuge that I can even be here today as the distinguished professor at a prestigious uh, university. And I've always told this story as this kind of heroic, I'm like the classic American, you know, uh, melting pot and uh, all of that. But uh, as, uh, you know, being in Canada and with there being more attention to reconciliation, they're still not successful really, but at least more attention to it. I've been reflecting on the fact that the safety and refuge and freedom that has come, um, you know, from, my, you know, that I have received has really come on the backs of peoples who lived on Turtle Island for many centuries uh, before settlers arrived. People whose suffering is something which, you know, I have literally directly benefited from. And also it can be direct, my economic well-being can be directly attributed to an economic system that as Laura talked about in the preamble to her unbelievable poem uh, is built not only on the repression of indigenous peoples, but also on slavery and still today benefits from racism. So that's my entry point to thinking about the ways that race is embedded in our system of capitalism. And so I'm going to probably, uh, hopefully this time share my screen again, and just take you through some of the arguments associated um, uh, with this story. And I'm gonna start, you know, travel a very different path, but I'm gonna end up in a lot of the places that Robert ended up. So hopefully you'll see the points of uh, contact. And I'm also gonna apologize for doing, for reading this because it was, um, hard for me to put the line of the argument together. And so I wanna keep, I wanna remind myself of what, what I'm thinking. As Wyke says, you don't know what you think till you see what you say. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm gonna start with Heather McGee uh, and her book, The Sum of Us, uh, which I uh, recommend highly to all of you. She, along with folks like Ibram X. Kendi, who's now at Boston University and who I'll come back to later, have shown that racist ideas do not precede racist policies, but the reverse. 
racism, both slavery and settler colonialism, is used as a justification for a particular economic system, which was predicated on a zero sum competition for profits and for land. Inventing race accomplished two things. It created a hierarchy and it legitimizes treating different groups differently. So McGee, uh, who I had the great privilege of speaking with in a public event that I organized recently, shows how racism allows poor white people to have social capital. She cites a study that found that people will give financial resources to those who have more than they have, as opposed to those who have less, just so that they can avoid being at the bottom. And this is how racism has eroded many public services. Uh, and it is, it is in this sense that it is a zero sum game people perceive it that getting giving something to people who are quote lower on the hierarchy and race creating that hierarchy uh it, you know means that you get you lose something yourself and this will directly tie into robert's point about sacrifice uh, her anchoring example is public pools that used to be in towns and cities across the United States. There were huge public pools that were available to anyone in the community or it turns out any white person in the community. And when there was a push to desegregate those pools, most communities, almost all communities chose to close the pools and fill them in rather than actually share them with black people. This to the great detriment of, of, of poor people or people with moderate white people with modest means who had used those pools and had benefited from them. And this extends to inaccessible and unaffordable education and healthcare, suppression of labor movements. You can think of the latest uh, Amazon vote in Alabama, loss of good jobs. All of these are instances of, of that zero sum thinking that she describes. And it connects to the student debt crisis and how affordable state education has been eroded. Public education systems have systematically been starved. I remember vividly Proposition 13 in California in 1978, which was about limiting real estate taxes, which of course benefited property owners, which of course is therefore racist because white people are much more likely to own property than blacks. Um, more about that in a minute, but a primary impetus was a California Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision that allowed somewhat for a redistribution of local property tax to poorer communities and to poorer schools. And that was the impetus to just cut property taxes and therefore cut funding to education overall. Um, uh, and this ultimately then contributes to the wealth gap. Um, uh, oh, let me, I lost track of what I was saying. I got so excited. Um, okay, so this is gonna tie directly to Tressie McMillan Cottom's work, who you're probably very familiar with her, who explores the impacts of this even in more detail in lower ed, where she shows what happens when pro private uh, profit-driven uh, public uh, education systems um, that would normally be a public good latches onto a system of inequality. And she found that particularly for single parents and folks on the lower tiers of employment, that time was of a premium, their time was stretched thin, and public higher ed, because it's under-resourced, didn't have amenities like uh, childcare on site that would allow people to take advantage of those uh, programs. And so it becomes uh, a, a rational choice for people at the lower end of the of the socioeconomic and racial system to go to these for-profit schools, um, which of course then just exacerbates the wealth gap because uh, they're then taking out lots of loans to, to pay to these for-profit institutions. Um, and if you've gotten a chance to see on Netflix, Shalini Kantaya's new film, Coded Bias, which again, I highly recommend, uh, she shows in that movie how search engine algorithms disproportionately target pe poor people and people of color with ads for the for-profit colleges. And we're talking here about Google deriving profits off of these ads. So racism really is embedded in all of these systems. It's embedded in everything. And if you saw the gorgeous cover of Bloomberg Business Week, it probably led you to, uh, if you hadn't read already, Dorothy Brown's book on the whiteness of wealth. She expands this conversation to explore the racial divide. And as example, right, right here in Boston, well, where the Harvard Business School is located, the average net worth of a black family is $8. The average for a white family is $247,000. As she's a tax specialist by training, uh, and she ties the wealth 
get way back to policies that sound neutral but end up being deeply racist. The Homestead Act, which was giving away, quote, free land, land that was stolen from the indigenous peoples, uh, was available to white people who could get this land if they were willing to homestead it. The GI Bill after World War II, which was meant to help people get education. My own father got his PhD using the GI Bill. Um, systematically channeled black people into trade schools and not into uh, traditional higher education. Most of the New Deal can be seen to have had racist uh, dimensions. The mortgage tax, de tax deduction is racist because blacks are less likely to own homes. The, the fact that they get, forgive capital gains on your primary home if you sell it uh, is also racist because black people's homes tend not to appreciate because of redlining in black neighborhoods. 401k and other tax advantage retirement benefits and flexible healthcare spending accounts are racist because blacks are much less likely to have jobs that would allow them to uh, avail themselves of these benefits. And tying back to Tressie McMillan Cottom's work, because of the lack of black wealth, black students are much more likely to carry student debt and much more likely to use any wealth accumulated later in their lives to support their parents rather than giving a leg up to the next generation. So the system really is rigged. So uh, again, going, getting back to my book and why I think I was asked to be on this panel uh, uh, on this topic is that uh, we can tie this back to this move towards stakeholder capitalism of which I am, I guess, a proponent, but I wanna raise some questions about that as well. Um, so I was fortunate that my book came out just a few weeks after the business roundtable announcement that they were going to uh, create value for all stakeholders and not just the shareholders signed by the elite CEOs of the largest corporations in the world. Um, and uh, you would think that that would mean that these CEOs would be committing to undo and dismantle some of the systems that I have just described above. Uh, you would also think that it flies in the face of our buddy Milton Friedman's uh, dictate that uh, you could, um, you know, the only social responsibility of the corporation is to create profits and there should be, they should not engage in anything else that doesn't create profits. And of course, this is the mantra that has lasted uh, up until really uh, today. Um, and uh, certainly during the go-go the years of the 90s when I was consulting at McKinsey and uh, you, you see it still in many conversations in boardrooms and executive suites. Um, but you know, you'd know, you think that this whole commitment to the stakeholder would then be set in some, somehow undoing this uh, settlement that we have around uh, Friedman's dictate, but clever thinkers uh, such as our colleagues right here at the Harvard Business School have found ways to preserve the status quo despite this commitment. Uh, take for example, Mike Porter and Mark Kramer in their work on shared value. They argue that the essential test that should guide CSR is not whether a cause is worthy, but whether it presents an opportunity to create shared value that is a meaningful benefit for society that is also, my emphasis, uh, a valuable to the business. And they go further to argue that you can only consider pursuing a social good to the extent that it increases operational efficiency, preserves the license to operate, or creates competitive advantage. You know, they say that generic social goods should not be pursued by the firm if there is not a benefit to the bottom line. So, you know, we can think of generic social goods meaning many of the things that I've been talking about here that Robert's talking about and are the subject of this entire conference. And in fact, this idea of shared value, which has been motivating to some people, um, has led to this conversation that Robert referred to of uh, the, you know, the business case for you name it, diversity, environmental, uh, good, uh, social responsibility, whatever it is. Uh, I may be a little bit less positive about the business case uh, than uh, uh, Robert is. Uh, if you see, we've been making the business case uh, for diversity in the executive suite for more than 20 years probably. And uh, we still have a situation where there are as many uh, CEOs named John as there are women all together. Now this is a little outdated, it's a few years old. You also have to note, you have to squint really hard to see any people of color in, that, um, in, in those pictures. And as a side, I have written uh, a few screeds against the business case um, in my book in an Academy of Management uh, uh, Discoveries article and in Fast Company. And I'm doing some research right now to figure out when, if ever, the business case works or what would be better solutions of the kinds of solutions that, um, that Robert was talking about, maybe more like the shark, the, the solutions that work for the sharks. Um, 
Okay, so this is where uh, shared value and stakeholderism has gotten us uh, so far, but um, I've become convinced, um, as uh, Joel Bakken has also argued in his latest book and movie, The New Corporation, I don't know if you remember his original book and movie in 2005 called The Corporation, this is called The Unfortunately, uh, Unfortunately Necessary Sequel, because so little has uh, changed since he uh, did his uh, uh, original work. And, you know, what he said is that corporate social responsibility is basically a power grab by corporations to take over functions that really should not be beholden to the bottom line at all, not, you know, not in the shared value framework um, that we hear from Porter and Kramer, and instead should be handled by democratic processes. Um, so the first win of the win win formulation should not be beholden to the second. Now, there's another argument to be made that we need corporations to engage in social responsibility because governments have failed in their functions um, and corporations have become these national border transcending entities. But, the, but part of that failure comes from corporate funded programs to eviscerate the government. Think of Citizens United and other decisions. So I wrote in my notes, yikes, it's complicated uh, because it is. So uh, what do we do? I'm now gonna turn back to Ibram X. Kendi um, and take a page from his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, which was really transformative for me, if for no other reason uh, than he argues that, and I quote, an idea, action, or policy is either racist, that is contributing to a history that regards and treats different races as inherently unequal, or it is anti-racist because it is trying to dismantle that history. There is nothing in between, unquote. Um, and you have to be anti-racist, and by extension, I'm talking about anti-racist, anti-elitist, anti-sexist, uh, anti-destruction of the environment. You can't just be neutral. So how to be an anti-racist or how to start dismantling some of these systems that we're talking about? Well, Heather McGee and her book that I mentioned earlier talks about truth, racial healing, and transformation. Uh, and I think a lot of those ideas are very consistent with what Robert talked about. In Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action number 92 states that companies must commit to meaningful consultation, building respectful relationships, and obtaining free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding with projects. And a key insight of this is that it can't just be a box checking exercise or a feel good process where you consult uh, with uh, the, uh, the indigenous peoples and then go and do what you are planning to do anyway. The goal of consultation is to understand the impacts and those trade-offs that Robert talked about in a way that allows projects, products, and services to be designed in ways that account for their impacts. So I think there's a lot to learn from the emerging process of reconciliation with indigenous peoples. I think a second recommendation is uh, that we need to stop trading in the myths of meritocracy and neutrality. Color colorblind is, is not the answer for sure. Not seeing race is not a solution to racism because race was used to justify policies. We thus therefore need to eliminate the policies themselves. I'm doing a study right now of comply or explain legislation in Canada, which is about women on boards. And the dominant explanation is we don't want to compromise uh, a meritocracy, we don't want to compromise quality, and therefore we have no targets and we have uh, no diversity policies. Uh, and so you can see how merit is being used as a tool to go slow and as a tool of the white supremacist patriarchy, especially when research shows that quotas actually increase quality, not decrease it. Okay. Third, I think we need to think about reparations, and I want to think about this in a very broad way. For a fully compelling case of this, if you haven't read ta Coates' article in The Atlantic of this title, you should. Um, individual companies that make good on the damage they've caused and are causing, I think, is going to be really important. You know, after the 2008 financial crisis, you know, Bank of America and Wells Fargo settled lawsuits about predatory lending in Black communities, and they paid over $500 million. Honestly, that wasn't enough for the damage that they did and they should do more. And I think that's a beginning and a starting place. I also wanna talk about reparations coming in the, in the form of broader policy reforms. And I know I only have a couple more minutes. So I just wanna mention that things like modern mon monetary theory, which says that deficit spending isn't necessarily as problematic as everyone thinks. And I think actually this obsession with deficits is in itself racist or Catherine Rayworth's work on donut economics, which talks about changing the dependent variable of our thinking so that we focus on the minimum, you know, you know sustainable livelihood 
good and what the planet can support. Not notably, these policies have been poo-pooed by traditional economists, uh, I should say white male uh, economists. Um, and if there's something you can notice about these two people is that they are not white men. Um, and that might explain why uh, these ideas, which are really about fundamentally redistributing uh, wealth in ways that work better for everyone in society are, um, you know, have been discounted. So I wanna to turn to our friend, Laura, because one, her poem was so amazing and two, because she and I had the opportunity to work together on a piece on, um, on allyship. And I wanna connect this to Robert's point about sacrifice because uh, what Laura and I argued uh, on allyship is that real action doesn't come cheap, that you actually, it has to cost you something or isn't real allyship. And I think that this is true as much at the individual level, which was the level that Laura and I were arguing, but also very much so at the level of the organization and of society that we need to step in front or step aside. And that might have costs for us, uh, but those costs are the costs that we must bear for all of the benefits that we have gotten for free on the backs of people, uh, indigenous peoples, black people previously, you know, who come, who have come from a, a, a history of enslavement. These are all obligations that 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 we have. So that's the basic case in a way that I make in my book, that there isn't any magical win-win, that shared value only takes us so far, that trade-offs are real, and so solutions are going to require innovation and transformation. Um, and so I'll conclude just by saying that the experiment that, um, one experiment that I've been running at the Institute for Gender and the Economy is through our uh, training uh, five course series uh, specialization on gender analytics, which is really intersectional gender-based analysis, where you know it's based on this hypothesis that one of the reasons we don't make progress is that well-intentioned people don't really know what to do. They don't know how to make that quote sacrifice happen. And so uh, the idea of this course is to get people to do the analysis to uncover those power dynamics that are related to gender, race, disability, and other things, and come up with transformative uh, solutions. And so the idea is to give people tools to explore the racism and misogyny at the foundation of our systems. So, you know, my, my answer to these challenges that we're talking about is innovation. I've always been an innovation scholar, and I hope that we can think about the possibilities for transformation. It may be the only silver lining that comes from this pandemic and this rise in hatred, hatred and racism is the fact that it's going to lead us more to think about innovative and transformative solutions. And so I hope this talk is an invitation for all of you to continue working as hard as I know you already are on these issues. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share these ideas.